Uh, we're going into the book of Acts. So if you would grab your Bibles, um, if you've got a smartphone app that you do the Bible on, pull that out as well. And we're going to go to Acts chapter 11. Um, and while you're turning to Acts, cha- actually, we're going to start in chapter 9. Um, I lied to you. Sorry. First lie of the day. Um, we're going to Acts chapter 9. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I forgot to mention, next Sunday is Father's Day. Oh, my goodness. And it's Bacon Sunday. If you've been around here before, we pass bacon during uh, Father's Day. So we've already got some guys who are grilling bacon for you. And um, uh, come back next week and drag dad to church. Amen? It's going to be so good. Um, okay, Acts chapter 9 is where we're going to go. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. All right. <sighs> I got some teachy stuff to do to you. Um, so just, just hang on for this first part. I've got to give you some backstory before we get to the real story today so that you understand the impact of what's going on. Everything today is going to have to do with Saul and Barnabas. Say Saul and Barnabas. Saul and Barnabas. Excellent, excellent. It's all going to have to do with them. So I've got to give you some of their backstory so that what happens with them today is going to make some sense to you. Saul, if you were here two weeks ago, I talked about his conversion. He was not a great guy, if you might remember that. He persecuted Jesus' church. He he killed many, many Christians through many in prison. He was not a great guy. And then Jesus miraculously reached out to Saul on the Damascus Road, blinding light. He struck blind. Jesus speaks to him directly. He gets converted. It's an amazing thing. But he had been such a bad guy up to that point, nobody in the church believed that his conversion was actually real. Maybe he's just a spy. Maybe he just made this up. Maybe he wants to hurt more of us. You can imagine how they would have drawn some of those conclusions. So here's what happens in verse 26. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, so he's going to the center of the Christian church at that time, Jerusalem. He tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe that he had truly become a believer. Now, this includes the apostles, by the way. The 12 apostles who knew Jesus, who worked miracles, and they're afraid of this guy. Verse 27, then Barnabas brought Saul to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. So the 12 are afraid. So they need somebody to go and vouch for this guy. For me, it's got a little bit of a vibe, kind of like a wine taster to the king. Like you go drink it first and if you don't die then we might. So you go see scary Saul, Barnabas, and if you survive the process, then maybe we'll meet with him. It's awesome. So that's the backstory that you need next. Verse 28, so Saul stayed with the apostles because that had all gone well and went all around Jerusalem with them, with the 12 apostles preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he debated with some Greek speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. He must have debated well, yes, <laughs> for them to try to murder him. And when the believers heard about this, they took it, heard about the murder plot. They took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. So not only is he saved, not only do they validate he's a real Christian, but he starts preaching the gospel of Jesus to unbelievers immediately, and he's so effective, they start a plot to murder the guy. And then super secret in the background, the 12 disciples send him back to his hometown so that he'll be safe. They're trying to protect him. So Saul then goes back to Tarsus, and he's there for maybe 11 years kind of on ice until we get to Acts chapter 11, verse 19. So now we're coming into today's official passage. You doing okay so far? We got more. All right, go to Acts 11, verse 19. It says, meanwhile, the believers who had scattered during the persecution of, uh, after Stephen's death, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria, and they preached the word of God but only to Jews. Now, pause right there. This is a big thing in the early church. We've been talking about it nonstop in the book of Acts. Jesus grew up as a Jew in Jewish culture, in the Jewish religion, part of the Jewish nation. And so when the church first started, they made the assumption that it was only for the Jews. 
And that's a big thing Pastor Ricky talked about last week with Cornelius is God kept trying to get through to them. No, you got to break down the barriers. You got to take this message of Jesus to everybody. And most of us in this room today are Gentiles, by the way. Amen. Aren't you glad they figured this out? Amen. Right? And so they're starting to push it first just to the Jews, but then they're going to switch. Verse 20, however, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the, to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. And the power of the Lord was with them. And a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Amen. The time frame here, we believe, is about A.D. 46. Now, sometimes when people, uh, church scholars, put uh, timelines together uh, from the New Testament, it's their best guess. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to tell you some stuff so that you kind of know where we're at, but this is not, um, this is, it, it's not like Dr. Luke who wrote the book of Acts is saying, and this happened in this year. He's not doing that for us but we're putting all the clues together and we think as much as possible, this is probably AD 46. This is probably 13 years after the birth of the church itself is where we are today. The gospel of Matthew was likely written in this same year and they began distributing the gospel of Matthew to the churches just to give you an idea of what was going on at that time. Now let me profile Antioch to you. Um, again, I'm doing some Bible study class stuff, but it's going to get funner later, okay? And I know funner is not a word, but I'm trying to wake you up. Um, Antioch, let's talk about Antioch. Antioch was the third greatest city in the Roman Empire. It's half a million people. Antioch is for real. And that's everything that we're talking about today is what's going on in Antioch. It's a, it's a Gentile city. It's a Roman city. And we're way outside of Israel at this point. The gospel is going out and it hits this major metropolitan area called Antioch. The three top Roman cities would have been Rome itself. And then Alexandria would have been the second one. The third one would have been Antioch. So it's a major metropolitan. Now, Antioch is one of 16 different ancient cities in Rome called Antioch. Are you confused yet? Why in the world would you do this? Well, there was this guy and his dad's name was Antiochus. And he started cities and he loved his dad. He named 16 of them. Antioch. I'm not joking. That's historically accurate. <laughs> so if you ever try to study Antioch, what you're going to see popping up in the scripture and in your uh, different study materials is they're going to call this um, Syrian Antioch. Syrian Antioch. So you know which one of the 16 you're talking about. Antioch is known for business. It's known for commerce. It's known for its wealth. Antioch is, is known for its culture, but it's also known for its immorality. It's known for its immorality because there was a cult there of Artemis and Apollo at Daphne, which is five miles right outside town. There was a temple there, and the primary mode of worship at that temple was temple prostitution. Wow. If you were going to go to worship there, you took part in temple prostitution. Now, just imagine the level of objectification of your fellow human beings that's going on in that. Think about the destructive abuse of people that's going on in the midst of that, let alone the destruction of, of marriages and, and committed relationships that's going on as part of that. Well, it's just part of worship. No. And that was at the core of that city. And so the gospel comes to Antioch, verse 22 of chapter 11. When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened in Antioch, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing there, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers, the brand new believers, by the way, to stay true to the Lord. And Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith. And many more were brought to the Lord through Barnabas. So they send Barnabas up to figure out what in the world's going on up there. And when he gets there, he sees this is a major spiritual revival happening. It's not a couple onesie twosies finding Jesus. A bunch of people are finding Jesus. This is going like wildfire. And so Barnabas has to respond. Now I've got a map just to geek out even more on you. 
Have we got the map? There it is. Okay. See Jerusalem at the bottom? He travels to Antioch. These are little pieces that we can just read right over top of in the scripture and not realize what they mean. His travel to Jerusalem is him, le- uh, um, all the way up to Antioch up there in the north, is him leaving his home country entirely. It is a 300-mile journey on foot for Barnabas. It takes him two weeks, at least two weeks, one way to get there. So when the apostles look at him and say, we're sending you to Antioch, that's sort of a big deal, amen? amen. It's a big deal. And he goes, and he goes ready to be a missionary and maybe even a pastor here. And he does become a pastor there. Verse 25. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. We're actually going to spend the whole rest of the message focused on that verse right there on 25. But I'll read the rest. When he found uh, Saul in Tarsus, he brought him back to Antioch, and both of them stayed there with the church for a full year teaching large crowds of people, and it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Um, It's one of the things that we've been enjoying through the book of Acts is this new group of people, nobody knew what to do with them. These Jesus followers, nobody knew what to call them. And several chapters ago, we were calling them the way, the people of the way, if you remember that. Today is the very first time that we see a reference to the word Christian. And when it started, scholars tell us it was a derisive term. It was a put down. It was like, look at these people. These are little Christs is what they were being called there. It wasn't wasn't a, a term of honor at all, but they took it as a badge of honor over time, the Christians did. And we call ourselves Christians today, amen? But that's where it started, was there at Antioch. Okay, so right there in verse 25, It says that Barnabas remembers Saul, and he decides to go up to Tarsus to see Saul. Do I have the second map of the day? There's only two, I promise you. Okay, so he goes from Antioch up north to Tarsus because he knows that Saul is up there. He's back at his hometown because that's where he was supposed to go. And it's a big travel. Again, another 179 miles. Uh, The water feature there is part of what makes that thing longer. Probably eight days one way, we're guessing there. So eight ways, eight days one way, eight days back. How long did it take Barnabas to find Saul once he reached the city? He didn't know what his address was necessarily, right? He's got to go looking for the guy. And when he goes looking for the guy, it's a big risk. He doesn't know that Saul's even going to say yes. He doesn't know what state he's going to be in after 11 years. He doesn't know if he's going to have the money. He doesn't know if he's going to have the health. He takes a big risk. I believe the Lord led him to do it, and so the Lord was in it. But you've got to appreciate the risk for the rest of the message to make sense to you. Um, He does it. He takes the risk. God blesses. Saul comes back to Antioch with him, and they become co-pastors at this new megachurch at Antioch. And it's massive. The whole rest of the book of Acts, we're going to keep referring to this newly formed team, Paul and Barnabas. You're going to get sick of hearing it. Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. But this is the beginning of their ministry relationship is right here. It's a big deal. It's like David and Jonathan and Moses and Aaron and Batman and Robin and Sam and Frodo. (laughs) Like they're partners. Like they just go together. Um, and they go together, and, and not only is there friendship there, but out of the friendship comes incredible ministry for God's kingdom. But you got to know that, that ministry doesn't just happen with professionals, guys. It happens with friends. Amen. And the relationship is the centerpiece of this today. Antioch will become this mega church in the ancient world. It's based in Syria up in the north like you saw in the map. And from this point forward, we're going to hear about Antioch also a lot. If you were with us for the first part of the Acts series, it was all about Jerusalem. And it was all about the 12 original apostles. But now it's going to be about Antioch sending missionaries into the ancient world. They will become the hub of the kingdom of God. It's going to be Antioch. But before we go any further with that, I just want to talk about what Barnabas has done here. 
Because that tiny little verse where it says that in the midst of this massive revival, in the midst of the beginning of a church plant, he stops and he decides to go get Saul. That's massive. So we're going to unpack it because there's three things that I believe Barnabas shows us in his action there. First off, Barnabas believed that two are better than me. Two are better than me alone. Barnabas bet on Saul. He took a risk. And Barnabas built Saul into a pastor. Gosh, the heart of a man like Barnabas. Uh, it's, it's an amazing picture of what he did there. Um, by investing in Saul, who became Paul, by, by saying, no, I'm not going to do this alone. I'm going to bring somebody else alongside. I'm going to mentor them, and I'm going to take a risk on them. By doing all of that, <clears throat> see, I think we would have gotten the apostle Paul no matter what. I just don't think we would have gotten pastor Paul without Barnabas. Because I think Barnabas invested his value system into him. Friendship is key to ministry. So here's a question. Why didn't Barnabas just do it himself? There he is in the middle of a revival. New church plant started. The apostles sent him. Why didn't he simply conclude, I can do this myself? I was sent here to Antioch. God must have had in mind, the 12 apostles must have had in mind, this was for me to do. You ever been there? You ever been in the midst of overwhelming demands and your, your, your um, inner dialogue starts going that this must just all be for me? Why didn't he do that? Maybe I'm called to walk this whole thing out alone. And you gotta keep in mind, this particular church plant is unique because it's not like modern times. It's not like Barnabas could have gone to three other churches right down the road, three other Christian churches, and stolen all of their staff and offered them more money and just brought them back to Antioch and had some help. He couldn't have done that. Nobody knew Jesus. They're all brand spanking new Christians. They don't have church leadership experience. He's all on his own. Maybe he could have done it, but he goes after Saul. Also, why didn't pride stop him? Because if you don't get anybody else, guess what? You get to be the big cheese, <coughs> right? Like this is gonna be my church. I'm gonna be the big dog pastor at the top. Like why didn't he conclude that and, and then if God did this great work in Antioch, then all the glory and all the credit would have gone to Barnabas. But he shuts all of that ego nonsense down. Amen. And he immediately stops and he goes to Antioch. Why? Ecclesiastes 4.9. Some of you guys know this passage. It says, two are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. A person standing alone can be attacked or defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Don't you love that picture? two people standing back to back against an army. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not e easily broken. Amen. Uh, one of the ways that we describe this when, when we're talking about this passage in weddings sometimes is, is that that husband and that wife comes together in marriage and that, that third strand is God coming in and making that marriage as strong as it can possibly be. But there's power in more than me. Why? Because you're not enough. I am not enough on my own. Amen. Could you say that out loud? I am not enough on my own. It's a place of maturity and strength to be able to say that to yourself. I am not enough on my own. Two are better than just me. One of the really curious things about Barnabas in the New Testament is he does a lot, and you're seeing this throughout the book of Acts. We don't have a single recorded sermon of Barnabas in all of the New Testament, not one. I've got all kinds of recorded sermons for Paul. I know tons about his style of preaching, but I got nothing for Barnabas. But I think Barnabas preached his loudest sermons through his actions. Amen. And I think this one is one of his loudest that in the midst of a major move of God, he doesn't just set to work doing it all himself. He's like, um, I'll be back in a couple months. I'm going to Tarsus to find Saul. It says so much about him, and it says so much today about who we ought to be. And could you imagine that conversation? 
uh, you're going to have to fill the pulpit for two months while I go because I'm going to go get this helper. And how about you over there? You're going to run the nursery while I'm gone. You're going to run the sound system while I'm gone. You're going to run this while I'm gone. It's okay. I know you're all brand spanking new believers, and I don't even know if Saul's going to say yes, but I'm going. Do you see the magnitude of his decision? It's, it, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around it. But he believed in Saul, and he believed in their friendship. It was a risk, though. When I say he bet on Saul, that's, that's an important point. How did he know he was going to say yes? I've had people bet on me. Have people bet on you? Uh, Bob C., my old lead pastor, bet on me. He took me out to breakfast one day and said, Josh, I think you're supposed to be a pastor someday, and I think you need to start preparing your life, preparing your family in order to be able to make that decision. He told me that at Bob Evans' restaurant, and I remember exactly where I was sitting in the restaurant when he told me that because it's that big of a conversation. I might have laughed at him when he said it, just, just couldn't imagine it at the time. But not only did he do that, but then for 10 to 12 months, he discipled me and another group of guys. He walked us through how to study the scriptures. He walked us through how to pray, how to do ministry, how to share our testimony, how to memorize scripture. Like he, he absolutely backed up what he had said with all kinds of preparation and action. He developed me. He's the guy who eventually hired me out of my technology career into pastoral ministry. I, I stopped working as a, as a coder on Friday, and I started as a pastor on a Monday. That's how my story went. Bob C. took a bet on me. And I remember as I came in and I started doing ministry, he had me preach my very first sermon. And the way he did it is he had me write it, and then he took me into the sanctuary on a Thursday and I preached the sermon to an empty room except for him. And he was sat in the front seat, in the front row. And he laughed at all my jokes. And I didn't deserve it, any of it. And then he gave me feedback after the sermon was over. I mean, I preached the entire thing to just him. And once it was, once it was all done, he walked up to me and he's like, you just preached the worst sermon of your life. Now it's over. <laughs> it was a good line. But what a gift when you're starting out and you don't feel like you know what you're doing for somebody to say, I'm going to sit here and give you an hour of my time. I didn't preach for an hour, Matt, but it could have been. Um, but anyway, he just sacrificed. He took a chance on me. Part of kingdom work is betting on people. And I say betting on people, and that, that might be tweaking some of you. But the reason I say betting on people is because I could have taken all that investment that Bob put into me, and I could have gone to another church and tried to make more money someplace else. I could have not transitioned well into ministry. All kinds of things could have gone wrong. Some of you guys sitting here, you've invested in people, and then that investment did not pay off. And so when I say it's a risk to invest in people, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But guess what? In the kingdom of God, we just keep investing in people because it doesn't matter if it's a risk. Invest in people because that's what Barnabas did. Yeah. <sighs> Here's another question. Why didn't Bar Barnabas recruit from Jerusalem? So I imagine him there in Antioch. He knows he needs help. Let's say he's willing to admit the fact that he needs help. I'm not, as a smart guy, going to Tarsus up north for Shady Saul, you know? I'm not going to do that. I'm going down to Jerusalem where all the apostles are. Why? Because Peter, John, James, like one of those guys surely can come up and co-pastor this thing with me. And these guys had done miracles. They walked with Jesus for three years. Like they know church leadership. They watch this church in Jerusalem start to blossom. They can bring those lessons to Antioch for me. Like that's what would make sense. They were the ones that had originally sent him. Surely they would have said yes. Why didn't he go down to where it was easy? Why didn't he go down to where it was guaranteed? Why did he go up to Tarsus? Here's why I think. There's an illustration that a guy named Wayne Cordero, pastor in Hawaii, gave. And he said, imagine this. Imagine there's a forest, big forest full of healthy trees. And imagine right at the pathway going in the entrance of the forest, there's a big pile of wood furniture all piled up there. 
And one day, you need a wood chair. It's like, what are you going to do? Well, I know what we're all going to do. You're going to go to the pile of already finished furniture. You're going to grab yourself a wood chair, and that's it. The problem is, in the church of God, that's what we all often do. If you're an usher and you need more ushers, guess what you want to do? You want to go ask some people who've ushered before. You want to go to the experienced people inside the church who are likely going to say yes, already know how to do it. You know that they're not scary. And you're going to ask that person, what's the problem with the furniture pile? It's finite. You run out. You run out of people like that. And also you tend to wear down the same people in your church by doing that over and over and over again. What Barnabas just did is he went into the forest. That's what Tarsus is. He's like, I'm not going to the already trained people. I'm going to crazy Saul up here in Tarsus. And I'm going to pull him down and we're going to develop, mentor, and train that guy. That's walking into the forest, getting a tree, and making your own chair. The kingdom of God needs people who will develop people. Amen. And it's the harder road. Like if you're on the parking team today, and you're like, we need more people on the parking team. Don't just leave that to your staff member. You go find more people for your parking team. Can I just be direct with you for a second? Because here's the thing. It's not just about getting people on the parking team. It's about people who aren't currently in the game of ministry and giving them fresh purpose. It, it, it's the fact that God has given you a circle of influence even here at this church. People that you know, people that are just starting to love Jesus, just starting to attend Grace Fellowship. You go grab one of those people and say, you need to be on the team with me. And I'm going to make it okay. And all of a sudden, someone who did not have purpose has purpose now. Amen. Someone who didn't feel invited and wanted on one of our teams, all of a sudden they feel invited and they feel like someone who's wanted on one of our teams. You can change the whole kingdom of God one soul at a time. That's part of what we're called to do. Then the things start to play in your mind. But I can't ask that person on the parking team because they don't want to do it. I'll just be bothering them. Anybody else hear these voices? I'll just be bothering them. If they wanted to do it, they'd already be on there. I've seen them, I know that person, they're way too busy. Here's the thing, all that is lies. They are way too busy, but you being way too busy didn't stop you from following the purposes of God. So why should it stop them? And here's what you don't understand about people is people want to follow the purpose of God in their life. And a lot of times we're ashamed or we're disappointed in ourselves that we haven't yet. Invite them in, show them how, give them the open door. Uh, one of the things Kobe Edwards, one of our elders, likes to say to me is, don't say no for people. Sometimes I'll start making a speech like, I can't do X because this person over here doesn't want to do X. And he's like, don't say no for people. Let them say no for themselves. You might be shocked. Enter into the conversation and see what happens. Build the kingdom of God. Barnabas did not say no for Saul. Barnabas did not go to the furniture pile. He went into the forest. So disciple people and sow your life into them. All right? Now, one more thing. I got one more thing. I think Barnabas has got one final lesson for us. And this is a bit of a right turn. I want to talk to, to you about your life and your family for just a minute. Are you overwhelmed? Are you overwhelmed with your life? Are you tired? Do you feel like you've got more than what you can handle? Sometimes things get so heavy, right? Some of you are swimming in toddlers and diapers and sippy cups and vomit. Some of you are caring for aging parents today. Some of you are overwhelmed with your job, your new job, your old job, the job that you're trying to get. 
the relationships that are messy at your job. Some of you are overwhelmed with your family relationships that don't seem to fix themselves as much as you've tried. Some of you are overwhelmed with uh, mental health issues and depression or headaches or whatever kind of terminal pain that you're going through. Some of you are overwhelmed with diseases like, like cancer that have come into your life. Some of you are like, I would check all of those boxes or multiple of those boxes and I'm just flat overwhelmed by it all. And there's days, right? Like there's days where you can feel like you can handle it all. Like this is, this is the kind of life I can handle. I'm getting it done. But man, there's other days that come along and you just feel lost. You just feel lost. And it's right when you feel lost that a really well-meaning Christian comes along and says this zinger to you. Well, God won't give you more than you can handle. They say that, don't they? I'm going to show you in the next minute how that is not scripture. God did not say that. And when they say that to you, not only is it poorly timed, but it is absolutely inaccurate, is not what God has said to us. He would not. So let me show you the actual verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Now I've got to give you a couple technical things here. First off, the Greek word there for temptations all throughout that thing is the same exact green, Greek word. It means temptations and it means trials. It means both. It means your sin struggles and it also means your overwhelmed life. Both. And God is not the author of all of that confusion in your life. But the verse is coming along and saying, but God is regulating some of this, yes? Like even the book of James says, your sin comes from your own dark heart, by the way. It doesn't come from God. But God does regulate this stuff. And he doesn't want to necessarily overwhelm you to where you have no options. So let's try to unpack what this actually means. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. But what's funny is go on to the next phrase. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Okay, if the Christian was right, who made that little bumper sticker theology statement to me, if it's all just God will never give you more than you can stand and they leave out the second part, what they're really saying to me is that God will never bring enough burden into your life that you can't handle on your own. On your own, in your flesh, with your own strength. That's what they're saying. And that's the part that's wrong. Because in the final phrase that they left out, God says, but if you need a way out, all you've got to do is ask. I've got an escape hatch ready for you. Well, wait, wait a second. Why would I need an escape hatch, God, if you're regulating and making sure I never get overwhelmed by life? Because you are getting overwhelmed by life. And he does allow you to get overwhelmed by life sometimes even intentionally. And this is going to mess with us. Why would God allow you intentionally to get overwhelmed? Here's why. Because we as a people, every single person in this room, we are too self-reliant. Amen. I can do it. It's just me. And God has to deal with that inside of us. And sometimes the only way he can deal with that inside of us is to lovingly, intentionally, and consistently overwhelm us with life so that we finally throw up our hands and we surrender. Amen. Say, God, you got to help me. Come on. God, I need help. This is too much. That's what the verse is saying. The verse is saying you get to the point of surrender and that's mission accomplished for God. Yes. And when you do that, He's standing by saying, I was waiting for that prayer. Hallelujah. I was waiting for you to say that because that's what I was really after was this surrender and you letting go of your self-reliance. Okay, now we're going to tackle this thing as a team. Now do you see what Barnabas was doing? 
Barnabas is in the middle of a wonderful, explosive, yet overwhelming thing. And he says, I need help. Do you see the wisdom in him? Do you see what he's shouting to us 2,000 years later? Quit it with the self-reliance, folks. We need God, amen? Amen. Um, I stole this illustration too. I steal most of my illustrations. (laughs) Only the good ones, though, for you. Um, But it's a guy in a rowboat, and it symbolizes your life, and you're in that rowboat, and you're on the ocean, and the waves are going, and the storm's going, and you're rowing. You're trying to get through it. You ever, you ever row and try to get through your life? And what happens when your career or your family or whatever starts just getting overwhelming? Guess what we all do? We all row harder, don't we? And here's the thing. Rowing harder and trying to solve problems and working hard, those are good things, by the way. I'm not trying to poo-poo that at all. Like, that's good stuff. We should want to do that. But there's some weird, like, like, magic line in that rowing process as you're trying to deal with your overwhelming, heavy life. Whereas you're rowing and you're trying to fix it all and you can't, you cross this line where you start to get angry. You cross this line where you start to feel alone in your rowing. And you cross this line where not only am I angry and I'm alone, now I'm bitter. And if you're rowing through anger, loneliness, and bitterness right now, that's not good. To put it in 1 Corinthians terms, it's time to put up a sail. It's what Barnabas did. I can't do this. I'm going to need some help. He lets God come in and provide the wind. And it's the wind that was meant to keep him afloat, not more rowing. (coughs) He could have done more rowing. So can you. But there's a place of surrender here. And I know it's complex and I know it's messy because what I'm really asking you to do just to get really practical here is the next time it's too heavy and next time it's too overwhelming, you actually pray the prayer and say, God, you got to show me the way out of this thing. And his answer may change from situation to situation, trial to trial. He may give you an answer that you didn't have before. He may tell you to go after a person you'd never gone after before. Who knows what God is going to do? It's specific to your situation. What's important is that you surrender. That's you putting up the sail. Would you guys stand up? We're going to pray. I'm going to say a prayer. But here's what I really want. Because there's just too many of us in the room today that are overwhelmed for real. And this was, this was just you. This, what we were talking about here at the end is just you. And you need to say this prayer before you leave today. We're going to have prayer teams in the back. Um, they're over there by the prayer chapel. Go see one of them. <clears throat> Share your situation. Be real about it. Really surrender to God today before you leave. If you can't pray with one of them, you need time alone, go into the prayer chapel Sit on one of the pews in there. It's beautiful. It's quiet. Have your time. Have your space. But have your moment with God. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that you would give us a courage today to do the business that we need to do today with you, God. And Lord, I pray for healing all across this room. I pray, Lord, that as we give up our self-reliance, that, Lord, you would come in with a plan. You would come in with your word. You would come in with your power. And God, lead us on a whole new path. We can do it with you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ's name.